and here we go. Bismillah. Hello and welcome to episode 41 of the Absid History Podcast, an audio platform to examine pre-modern Islamic, Islamic history and a global medieval past and the first of a new series of filmed interviews following the success of our uh, 40, 40 audio only episodes. We are sponsored by IHRC Bookshop. Listeners get a 15% discount on all purchases. Visit IHRC Bookshop at shop.ihrc.org and use discount code AHP15 at checkout terms and conditions apply contact IHRC bookshop for details. I am your host Dal Hassan, a PhD student at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London now on to the show. Uh, today we're going to discuss this book here What is Islam by Shahab Ahmed. It's a book which in the blurb is described as follows. In What is Islam Shahab Ahmed presents a bold new conceptualization of Islam that challenges dominant understandings grounded in the categories of quote religion and quote culture or those that privilege law and scripture he argues that these modes of thinking obstruct us from understanding islam distorting it diminishing it and rendering it incoherent what is islam formulates a new conceptual language for analyzing islam it presents a new paradigm for how muslims have historically understood divine revelation one that enables us to understand how and why muslims through history have embraced values such as exploration ambiguity aestheticization polyvalence and relativism as well as practice such as figural art music and even wine drinking as islamic without any quotes between them um, it also puts forward a new understanding of historical constitution of Islamic law and its relationship to philosophical ethics and political theory, a book that is certain to provoke debate and significantly alter our understanding of Islam. What is Islam reveals how Muslims have historically conceived of and lived with Islam as norms and truths that are at once contradictory yet coherent. At the same time, this book is very difficult to read, I found personally, and I think many others did as well, and which is why I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Abdul Azim. Ahmed, who wrote this book review, and that helped me personally make a lot more sense of it. Dr. Ahmed completed his doctorate in 2016, an ethnographic study of a British mosque. He has since continued his work and research in British Muslim congregation studies, but with a long standing interest in the history and settlement of Muslims in Wales. He has a passion for the public communication of, of religion, as it put here, and is founder and editor of On Religion, a magazine that explores faith and society. He's currently a research associate in British Muslim studies at Cardiff University, and he's a deputy director of the Centre for the Study of Islam in the UK. And he's also working towards a publication of a book telling the story of Britain's nearly 2000 mosques. Welcome, Dr. Ahmed in Cardiff. Assalamu alaikum Talha, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be joining you on this podcast. I feel a bit like an imposter as I'm not a pre-modern Islam, you know, uh, a scholar of pre-modern Islam. But I think uh, hopefully this conversation will be quite illuminating and interesting um, because I've always been keen on trying to um, engage across the board and I, and I really uh, value uh, your engagement with me. So very glad to be here. Uh, so I think the thing about this book is that whether you're studying um, Islamicate or Islamic or Muslimic or whatever stuff, contemporary or historically, mm. this is about a method of understanding. Mm. Um, and, and, and that's why I think it will be relevant for, for, for lots of people. And I imagine it's also on a lot of reading lists now, like maybe whatever uh, Edu size Orientalism would be on any reading list on Islamic history or contemporary Islam or whatnot, right? Okay, first things first. So um, I found this very difficult um, and let me explain how, so I'll explain probably like a lot of students who may be reading this at the moment, I'll explain to what, what was happening when I was reading it. So on the one hand, he seems to be, he, he's, he's not saying Islam is how Muslims understand it because that's the impression you get as mm. you're reading the book, right? And then he explicitly says, no, that is not what I'm saying. And then you're left thinking, well, what are you saying, right? And he, because he's trying to he's trying to square this contradiction or paradox, right? Depending on how you see it, right? It's on this illustration. So that's a Mughal emperor, Jahangir, I think, and he has this wine cup here, 
and and and, and at the same time on the coin he's um described as if i can find the image it's kind of like a defender of the faith or such like right he's holding the quran in his um i think left hand as well as at the bottom right so you can see that that is holding a book there which is which is said in the to be the quran and that, that's mm. supposed to be a wine glass. so how do we make sense of that right is that islamic right so 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 that's what he's trying to do and 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 although shahab ahmed says it's islam is not what muslims say it is that's the impression you get so that's point one point two is he talks about this thing called pretext text and context right which again um i think if you come from back on lit literary studies maybe that makes sense but i didn't understand what that meant right i i don't think i quite got that i didn't know whether that meant like uh you have like a value like wisdom so when the quran talks about wisdom it's sort of understood by the people around them and then you can have a a localized sense of what wisdom is but there's always this like overarching sort of platonic wisdom right um so that's one difficulty i had with the book that could i couldn't make sense of um and maybe the others will come up as we talk but so he starts off with these six questions maybe you want to t tell us about these six questions about Islam is that, that he then goes on to try to sort of deal with. Absolutely. I mean, um, for me, I think one of the interesting things engaging with the work was it was addressing questions I was wrestling with at the time. Um, and that's why I found, I think I found it useful. I think I also had one advantage in that when I read the book, I wasn't in academia. It was in a brief period where I was employed in um, the charity sector, the third sector, um, and that gave me two things. It gave me distance from a lot of academic inquiry um, and it gave me time to digest the book. So I was reading it, uh, weirdly enough, as a way of keeping connected to um, uh, academia while I was doing all this other stuff. So I think I allowed myself the time to really just think through what he was saying. Um, and for those two reasons, I found the book really uh, enjoyable, engaging, um, and I really, I think, uh, was convinced of some of Shahab Ahmed's arguments, not all of them. Um, and yeah, those six questions as well um, are a good way, I think, of beginning the uh, work, because in a way, I think it's his six questions that drove him to write this work. And I can't really remember all of them off the top of my head, but there's two or three of them, which I think stand out. Uh, the first is that question of what's Islamic about drinking wine? Um, and trying to kind of engage in this kind of valorization of wine drinking and poetry, the images like the one you just described. But really, I think the most interesting question and the question which, to me, I think drives home um, the rest of the work is his question about what's Islamic about Islamic art. And I've seen this discussion had in different works like um, sort of Bauer and uh, Cultural Ambiguity and Alternative History of Islam. I've seen it on TikTok. I found there was this um, really interesting TikToker who did little sections of um, kind of commentary on Islamic art or, you know, those geometric patterns, uh, which are distinctively part of um, the Islamic cultural artistic expression. And she had a few TikToks where, you know, people were saying, well, what's Islamic about it? You know, surely we don't describe Western art as Christian. We describe it as American or British or French, you know, Isn't, aren't we just reducing Islam to this homogenous mess by calling everything produced by Muslims throughout history Islamic art, even if there's nothing Islamic about them. Um, and I think that question to me is a really good one of framing the rest of the work, which is, you know, if you imagine you have this collection of artwork produced from this kind of 1400 year uh, history from different countries um, uh, in different ways, some of them figurative representations of people, some of them geometric patterns, some of them, you know, Mughal miniatures, others uh, calligraphy and uh, different forms of calligraphy, what ties them together? What makes them Islamic or part of Islam in a broader sense? Or do we cut them out from uh, Islam as a whole uh, and make them something else, which is, you know, the cultural expression or the, you know, uh, secular expression of Muslims? Um, so that question for me, I think, framed the book. Um, and in a way, um, I think the title, What is Islam?, um, is, I wouldn't say misleading, because he is trying to talk about Islam. 
But really, I think the most important part of it is the subtitle, what is Islamic or the importance of being Islamic. And so I think if you come over from that side, you know, what is the, the, the meaning of Islam when we look at this art? What is the relationship between this art and, and, and uh, Islam? And we can apply that question to so many different things. And it can even apply to questions of what is the relationship between this violence and Islam? Because he does address that in the book. We can talk about it. What is the relationship between, you know, this this debate, this um, form of dress, this, um, you know, uh, form of writing of poetry and Islam? Um, so I think those questions frame it well. But for me, that was the thing that was really interesting, especially as a social scientist of contemporary Islam. Very often I was asking that question. What's the relationship between this social practice I'm observing and Islam? Um, so I think that frames the book for me much more uh, accurately. Um, whereas I think sometimes the angle of is this Islam or not ends up getting you down this question of orthodoxy, which um, isn't a helpful way of framing the book. So, okay, so, when, so j just to be clear, I don't think... Well, we would like to come to an answer to the question, what is Islam, right? Mm. At the end of this, right? Um, because some people say, well, that's clear. Islam is Quran and Sunnah, following the Salaf. End of discussion, Aki. Like, why, why, are we, why are we here, right? And then I think that there's, there's something he brings um, at the... He brings his sites, Abdul Hassan al-Ashari, and his sites... Um, some historian, I'm trying to find it because I think it, it shows why an answer like that can not always satisfy mm. the, the phenomena of, of what we experience. Um, I can find it. So basically, um, Abul Hassan al Ashri is just saying how you know there's been so many um differences amongst Muslims about um. You know what, what what it means to be you know, different interpretations and, and 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 whatnot, which I don't think precludes um, a sense of there being parameters of what is correct. I mean, at least mm. if you're a professional Muslim or a believing Muslim, and I mean, there's there's obviously parameters in that. But then, like, d d the question still comes around. Then, is Abu Nawas's wine drinking? poetry islamic culture and then that's, then that's where we sort of get stuck right mm. and he here's it so so some people may, may know of a marshall hodgson's um he, he's islamic and islamicate right marshall hodgson being the chicago um historian who wrote ventures of islam and so he talks about Islamic, Islamic, Islamic is a religion, Islamic is a culture, right? Mm. And to make things even more complicated, Shahab Ahmed says he disagrees with, with that as well, okay? Mm. And then, then I sort of get even more lost, right? Because, he, because, because then Shahab Ahmed says, no, actually, the, the, the Abu Nawaz's wine drinking poetry is Islamic. It's not Islamic. Hate. And then Shahab, Shahab Ahmed sort of critiques Hodgson's um, binary, and then and then I just get and then I just get more confused. So I don't know if you can help us on that as well. Well, again, I think this is one of the things where Shahab really sold me because um, you get this a lot amongst anthropologists and social scientists. They'll talk about Islam in different ways. So he has this section where he talks about Islam as culture, and so that's a kind of very you know a very influential scholar in ethnography was Clifford Goertz. Uh, interpretation of culture. He did some work in Indonesia and in Morocco. Um, and his kind of expression of what religion is, is very much one which is a broad cultural milieu. Um, there's also this idea of there not being Islam, but Islam's plural. So really different expressions of um, Islam in different societies and continents and cultures or contexts and uh, historically as well. Um, and then there's this kind of Islam as law, which again kind of reduces it or focuses on one aspect of the religious dimension. And Jahab kind of uh, in this sort of very, um, you know, uh, broad stroke says, well, actually, let's just clear the ground of all of that. And here's a quote I can't remember exactly. Um, and he might be quoting someone else here, but he says kind of Islam is its own continent with its own borders and boundaries. So kind of what I sense he was trying to say there is, you know, there's no 
you can't use these categories of religion and culture when it comes to Islam. You just have to create your own new for, uh, foundational categories to understand Islam as it's operating historically and today. So you just kind of clears the ground. So forget culture, forget Islam and Islam's forget um you know religion all these terms let's just approach islam fresh so i think that's what he's trying to do um that's one area where i kind of disagree with him or i find him slightly unhelpful because i think um it's as much as i agree with his critiques of islam as culture or uh, islam as law i also find there is a value in the term religion even as it's debated um and it has kind of different ideas and concepts of what religion is in practice um but you know that's a debate for another day um, so he kind of clears the ground and he kind of puts forward his own idea of what Islam is, um, based on this idea of pretext, text, and context. Um, and this again kind of comes back to Talha. Uh, sorry, it wasn't Talha. Is it Talha? Talal. Talal Asad. Sorry, bro. I got you in front of me and I'm thinking Talha, but it's Talal Asad. He talks about Islam as a kind of discursive process. Um, so his kind of, I think, expression is trying to get rid of those, um, I guess, arbitrary distinctions between what is Islamic in terms of the religion and what is Islamic in terms of culture or this idea of a plurality of Islams out there. And trying to say there is a coherence. There is a coherence historically and globally, geographically, uh, that binds uh, all these practices together from Indonesia to Morocco, from uh, the Balkans to Bengal, as he speaks about, from, you know, uh, Mauritius right the way through to um you know, uh, let's say Mumbai. Um, so there is some coherence. Um, and kind of coming back, I guess, to this idea of wine drinking or um, similar. For me, I think, is what is Islam or this, this particular book needs a part two because I kind of been mulling this over since I've read it, which is that question of, you know, is Shahab Ahmed just saying Islam is wherever Muslims say it is? Um, and he's not saying that. And he even quite, I think, aggressively defends himself in that position in one of the pages uh, over several pages. But I think he is saying Islam is effectively anything Muslims do in relation to pretext, text and context. And we can come to that in a, in a few moments. So it does open up Islam almost to the point of being so open that it becomes a meaningless category. Um, in the sense that, you know, you can bring along anything and have a relationship to it in a way which is meaningful in the in the context of Islam, as in, 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 in the sense of pretext, text and context, and thereby make it in some way part of Islam or Islamic. And, you know, this is true of wine drinking, but it's also true of forms of violence, it's also true of any type of relationship, uh, any form of dress. Um, but I'm also a big believer that there is something we can call normative Islam, um, orthodox might be one way of saying it orthopraxis might be another way of saying it but there is some coherency and some boundaries to what has historically and today been considered um, you know Islam true and proper and not Islam uh, you know outside the kind of vision of the Prophet Muhammad and so I think there is a secondary work needed because I agree things need to be opened up because I think our um, the way we have been understanding Islam has been reduced and helpfully by modernity um, and a certain reification of what religion is in Western society. Um, and Shahab's opened it up, which I think is very helpful. But I do think there is a secondary work, another work waiting to be written that helps us bring things back into um, a, a more narrower and um, a more uh, sort of um, distinctive frame of what is normative Islam versus what is heterodox Islam, if that makes sense. So I can't actually remember if I've answered your question, but I hope that's that's given some of my thinking on on that kind of line of thought. I think with a book like this, there's so much to unravel, and then the conversations that ensue from it requires so much more unraveling. And and um, I think it shows us that like the terms we use, how often um, we're speaking at each other, not with with each other, especially when we use certain words where we where we understand them very differently um mm. like, the, like words like liberal for example can both sort of an insult and, and praise for different mm. people in different contexts right um and obviously when, when you're talking about something like you know you need you need for clear clear definitions or for for, for anything you're, you're 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 discussing okay that's just first first step of of of, of intelligent discussions right um and so 
So we come back to this, like, come back to the wine drinking, coming back to Abu Nuwas and his wine drinking poetry, right? Mm. Is that Islamic? It's, it's, it's the Sunni Orthodox Muslim will say wine drinking is prohibited and celebrating is prohibited, it's wrong, it's immoral. Okay, we mm. get that moral judgment. Um, at the same time, we know that um, when it comes to making aesthetic judgments, morality is irrelevant. And I remember um, look, looking at um, uh, one, one of the, one of the uh, medieval um, uh, pre-modern um, critics of Al-Mutanabbi, the, the, um, the so-called Arab Shakespeare about whom we did an episode uh, with uh, Dr. Um, Blankenship, which you can find in our archives. One of these pre-modern critics, when talking about, uh, whilst uh, talking about Mutanabbi, uh, one of the Jurjanis, I can't remember which one it was, um, m- mentioned that point, that when, when it comes to aesthetic judgments, morality is irrelevant. Otherwise, when it comes to pre-Islamic poetry, we'd have dismissed all of it. Okay, because it's got paganism, it's got wine drinking, it's got... Uh, uh, illicit um, relations with and all that kind of stuff, right? Mm. Uh, kind of. Um, so, so, so when we're coming back to Abu, Abu Nawaz, we can we 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 can we could talk about his merit as poetry. That that's that that's a that's a separate issue, right? Mm. In terms of like his balaga, his rhetoric, and whether it delivers what he intends to do and all that kind of stuff, right? But then, it, then we come. To, but then, is it Islamic? And then also, I think this is complicated by the fact that we're having this conversation in English, right? And then mm. perhaps this this will, later we can segue into your um, into your manifesto, I guess, for Anglophone Islam, which which I I think is really important, right? Um, because then I'm thinking, well, in Arabic, like, do they call? Would they call? Would they? Do, do they use the term Shi'r al Islami for? Um, the, the wine poetry of Abu Nawaz, or, or mm. I mean, whatever its equivalent is in Farsi and Urdu, or Yoruba, or Hausa, or any other kind of language of sort of Muslim people, right? Or majority Muslim people. So again, we come back because it's a what? It's, it's a wine drinking poetry. I think out of those six questions, which sort of is the most um, stands out the most, as well as well as the the, the figurative art. Um, mm-hmm. stands out stands out the most right um, so I guess ha- how how do we then how do we go about answering that again we see we're always coming back yeah in a way I think this um, crosses another boundary in terms of discipline and conceptualizations because I almost have two answers there. Um, and it's it, this is also a challenge I've had for myself as a scholar for a long time. But um, from my personal confessional attitude as a Muslim, uh, you know, there's very little Islamic uh, about wine drinking or to rephrase it, um, you know, there is little blessing um, or barakah in it. There is no um, acceptance by God and the Sharia in it. Uh, there is no sort of... Um, uh, meaningful spiritual development in it um, but then in a way what Shahab Ahmed's work has given me is a different answer which is how can I understand an individual's relationship between X practice or belief and their understanding of Islam um, and I guess previously I would have looked at wine drinking and really not understood what the relationship was um, and I think his work expresses a way of making sense of that relationship. But also, I guess, coming back to my more kind of contemporary angles of research, and you know, this is something that's never come up in my work, but I wanted to write about, which is, you know, there's uh, practices I've observed amongst drug dealers of, for example, um, avoiding the territory around the mosque. When it comes to the, uh, you know, there was, especially quite recently, there was, you know, where we are locally, there was... Um, I think a bit more pressure on the trade and there was some violence and similar flaring up. Um, and, you know, uh, I haven't spoken to a few younger people, uh, one or two of which were involved in, um, you know, sort of the networks 
they were like, okay, well, you're not allowed to, basically, there's a bit of a rule, you're not allowed to, um, you know, uh, do it around the mosque. And that's almost a way of recognizing the sacredness of the mosque and the, and the space of the mosque. Um, and it wasn't universally held in practice and practice and so on, but there was this kind of idea going around um, that sort of you give this bit of uh, space, you don't do it within eyesight of the mosque. And for them, that was meaningful and that was important in their relationship and expression of Islam. But there's no way of making sense of that, I imagine, without a framework like Shahab Ahmed's. Um, and I'm speaking now as a kind of um, social scientist of contemporary Islam because there's no text that says, or oh, don't drug deal drugs around Islam. There's no text that says don't, uh, you know, sell alcohol around uh, the mosque, you know, to be able to use that. There's obviously, you know, guidance about don't come to the mosque intoxicated and similar. But there's something else going on. They, they have a relationship and an understanding of uh, what Islam is um, and they're behaving accordingly. And it's something very foreign to me. It's something which I can't quite comprehend. But I guess Shahab Ahmed's framework and conceptualization of Islam allows me to see the Islam and the meaningfulness of that in relation to Islam um, uh, in their practice. And I think going back to the question of wine drinking, um, there's an answer which is, yeah, it's not Islamic. Or uh, if you skip the term Islamic, because that itself comes back to that question of Anglophone and what does it mean in, in the broader, um, what does Islamic mean really? But, you know, is this something which is uh, sort of uh, recognized as um, a valuable practice by Orthodox Islam? You know, there's a very clear answer, which it isn't. Um, but for some, it was. And for some, there was something meaningful in relation to Islam about it. And being able to see that and make sense of that in a framework was, I think, very helpful. So uh, in a very kind of true sort of um, academic sense, the answer is both yes and no. It's both you know, from one perspective, it's a no, but from another, you can see uh, it's a yes, or at least for the person who's practicing it. And likewise, you can apply that to lots of different things that Muslims do um, to make sense of uh, how they understand Islam as being present in that practice or action. I referred to earlier that, that statement of Al-Hassan al-Ashari, um, and uh, I, I'm gonna, I found it, it's in, it's in, it's, it, it, it introduces chapter one of the book, the six questions about Islam. So he cites two things. He cites first from the Cyclopedia of Islam. Islam, submission, total surrender to God, mustar, or verbal noun, of the fourth form of the root SLM, sin la mim, the quote, one who submits to God, end quote, is the Muslim in italics. Then the author cites Abul Hassan al Ashari, the the 10th century um, theologian, Sunni theologian. After their prophet, the people disagreed about many things. Some of them led others astray, while some disassociated themselves from others. Thus, they became distinct groups and disparate parties, except that Islam gathers them together and encompasses them all, which is from his um, Maqalat al Islam. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something. Um, to think about and then he has this anecdote uh in fact the book's full of lots of interesting anecdotes if, if you don't understand the book there's, a lot of, there's, there's just a lot of interesting little stories and, and mm. vignettes that uh, makes it entertaining even if you can't figure out what what he's trying to say as a whole uh, and it's phenomenal scholarship like there's just just some, like the the, the the breadth of, sort of reading and, and references and all that kind of stuff right mm. um an Arab friend of mine tells a story of her engagement to her South Asian future husband. The prospective fathers-in-law, who had never met, had to speak to each other by means of an international telephone call to formalize the matter. Neither spoke the other's native language. Both spoke some English, but not especially well, and neither was familiar with the, uh, with the other's culture. The Arab gentleman was a self-declared agnostic, whilst the South Asian practiced a semi-observant sort of traditional piety of the variety I once heard characterized by the expression, he says his prayers just enough to keep his wife happy. Needless to say, given the state of mutual foreignness, my friend was more than a little apprehensive as to how the conversation would unfold. What happened, she asked her father as soon as it was over. Did you understand each other? Of course we understood each other, he replied. We are both Muslims. 
Um, but again, it, it's just to complicate it again. Because Shahab Ahmed is not, it doesn't doesn't make that distinction like Hodgson's done between is, is Islamic religion, Islamic hate, mm. culture, right? And I guess people have to read the book and try and make it make sense of it for them for themselves, right? Um, and then you know when you said earlier that, like, is he like can you define Islam or is he define Islam as, as as so broad that it becomes nebulous and meaningless, right? Mm. And then I was thinking like this idea of um, how like like you have a primordial reality of the capital R, right? Which mm. we as practicing Muslims believe in, right? And and so that can manifest itself in sort of localized settings, right? Primarily, or well, initially started with sort of an Arab setting, but sort of Islam spread around the world. It has sort of localized kind of expressions of of certain virtues of modesty and how people dress. It differs from place mm-hmm. to place or whatever, right? Um, and I think one one of the ways that 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 idea is crystallized of, of this idea of the of, of the primordial is in 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 China, and it's something that oh, what's his name? Farouk Omar, or Omar Farouk, I always forget his name, the American uh, scholar of Islam, convert, has a, has a work called the, 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 the Imperative of Culture in Islam. You know who I'm talking about? I'm not a bad mind. Um, it might ring a bell if you carry on. Um, I can't quite so think. He, so uh, he, he, yeah. he, he says in his writing about how in oh, China, the, they don't the river, call, yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah. You understand what I'm, you know, you know who I'm referring to, right? Mm. They, don't, they, call, they don't call Islam, like Islam. In, in in the language they use a, a sort of indigenous term to mean pure natural way right mm. so 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 then so 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 then so so in a way you you, you have this idea of like islam just as an arabic word that just because the final revelation of, of, of the, the real the capital r just happens to come came to these came to came in arabic and therefore if we use this word right but it's 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 a more sort of fundamental idea which is which is more important, right? And then this is from the perspective of confessional Muslims, right? So what can happen over time is that people start confusing their very parochial co- colloquialized so sorry, very um parochial colloquial um localized manifestation of this primordial mm. reality okay and um and, and they confuse the two so they confuse the sort of the, the, the cultural manifestations with with the with the with what's called the deeper moral objective so i mean c- coming back to the book do you feel that he was also engaging with that as a whole? I mean, that, that, that's a topic I think is really worthwhile discussing because a lot of people have recently brought it up and it causes antagonisms, right? Because then it's, it's telling people that, that what you hold to be sacred actually is just a, a, a secondary manifestation. It's not, it's not. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And, and that idea of privileging or creating a hierarchy um, in that sense of closer or further <laughs> from true. Um, so if I was going to take Shahab Ahmed's conceptualization of Islam, um, and I think it is a conceptualization, it's not so much a definition because um, a definition has those boundaries, whereas a conceptualization is much more uh, uh, an open category. Um, my kind of image of it, if I was thinking of it visually, is something a bit like a tree. So the pretext is that primordial concept or or truth in operation that's the pretext i think it's jahab ahmed's view which is you know the idea of there being one creator and everything that subsequently follows from that for example the idea of there being predestination of fate because there is only one creator there is a coherence in the created universe um you know these ideas of life and death rather than reincarnation so you know there is a um linear idea of the temporal 
not so much a kind of circular one that you would find in certain Indian traditions, for example. Um, uh, you know, these are all the pretextual basis. And to me, that's the kind of root or even the ground that the tree is set in. And then you get to the um, text. And, you know, that's much more familiar, I think, for anyone who studied Islam. Uh, and that text is um, the kind of trunk um, uh, of the tree. Um, and for us, as we understand it, it's Quran and Sunnah. But um, as someone once pointed out to me, uh, Faha Shahab Ahmed, it's any product of revelation. So for, say, for example, some more um, spiritually, mystically orientated groups, if someone they considered to be particularly pious in expression in relation to God had a dream, and in that dream there was a um, sort of vision of the Prophet Muhammad, that becomes part of text, what happened there. So, you know, something like the Burda Qasida could become, under some ideas, you know, part of that text rather than anything else. And then the context becomes the, the branches upwards and more into those localized variations, those parochial expressions and everything that stems out from that. And some of those might be in um, a kind of normative Sunni legal expression well beyond the pales of acceptable Islam. And some of those might be in areas where there's not so much of a debate or discussion and uh, the law or the legal tradition doesn't have much interest. Um, you know, say, for example, in um, areas of certain kind of expressions of dress or modesty where you're kind of operating within a broad category of what is permissible from the legal tradition. And so you can kind of, you know, uh, innovate as you wish um, and so you get this kind of tree then which is all the expressions everything that's been done and I think the metaphor or the image Shahab Ahmed uses is like a city um, and context is a city um, so it's everything written every commentary every piece of poetry every piece of art you know it's uh, everything from a recipe book of you know uh, food to um, you know, a, a legal text to a, you know, um, a spiritual instructional manual. You know, it's it's the whole expression of what it means to be Muslim by an individual and a community and a society and a civilization. Um, so that kind of becomes the image as I, as I think of it. Um, and coming back to your kind of question of, you know, is this is there this idea of kind of a platonic ideal or the primordial, the the true? And then the kind of revelation down and then the localized variations. I think Shahab Ahmed's um, argument is that the tree in its entirety has a claim to be part of Islam. And one branch can't be necessarily privileged over another. Um, and the furthest branch, for example, from the root. So something which is uh, quite distant from the text, but based on context, based on context, based on context, um, you know, uh, still has a claim to be as Islamic as the as the text itself. Um, so he kind of creates this sort of, uh, I think, uh, a broader claim where we're not um, privileging certain understandings of Islam over others. So um, to me, that's what it kind of pushes us towards, which is, you know, um, uh, there's nothing more Islamic, say, for example, than a South Asian, um, you know, uh, veneration of a saint or a shrine, um, than uh, you know, uh, a particular say um, practice in the Middle East that kind of combines uh, pre-Islamic mythology um, around jinns and and black magic with Islam, um, or you know, even uh, as we might say, kind of Israeliyat, the kind of Jewish law. So that's where Shahab Ahmed, I think, lands. Um, and that's kind of where I come in and feel there could be some pruning <laughs> necessary in a way. So if, if you do have this broad conceptualization, very useful for um, breaking away from reductive ideas of what Islam is, but still that tree would need a degree of um, husbandry, a degree of um, a pruning to be meaningful to a Muslim. Before we round up to the hour, and I'll give you a chance to um, tell us about what you're currently doing and, and any forthcoming projects. And also, I think I, I, I want to hear about this idea of the Anglophone Islam. Mm. We, we should dedicate some more time to, to, to talk about that. Um, I want to, um, the, the first thing that came to my head as I was listening to you before I, I read something from, from, from the book, is that someone can say, okay, Islam is 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 what the Prophet Muhammad taught and its revelation, 
and then if you're asking is wine poetry islamic no it's not it's islamic it's it's arabic or it's persian or it's uh, mm-hmm. abbasid or whatever right and um um and so for some people that can just 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 a nice sort of closure to all of that right um but then if we if, we, if we're using islamic as meaning what's right and wrong then mm. heterodox as, as as by this by this statement of hassan ashad it comes out heterodox would also be included as islamic right like or like whatever whatever you dislike about um other sectarian variances right and as wrong as you'll see them they'll, they'll still sort of come under the rubric of well that still is islam right it might be a wrong form of islam right or a, a misunderstanding of islam right but mm. so then we come back we just still end up coming back to the, the same question what is islamic right mm. um and i and i think a lot i think that the confusion of the question comes because we're talking about this about this in, in english and which is not historically a muslim language but as you're going to argue which you do argue which you convincingly argue which i i take on board as well in terms of my um mission for for what this abbasid history podcast is about which is about raising the, the the bar the minimum bar of, of us as a community and as, as as humanity in terms of how we conduct ourselves in terms of our character in terms of culture okay and for us to be wiser and better people right um i i think the, the question was islamic only really is, is a really sort of um a, a, um, an anglophone thing right because mm. cause, but, but when, when both of you and i so although I've, i'm doing historical stuff and doing contemporary stuff but, but because we're doing this muslamic stuff right when we read the literature that comes in english or in french or in german right is it it tends to be written by a non-muslim right and it tends to come with the perspective that these things are different and then it's really confusing when, when uh, this was something i've experienced and i'm sure you experienced you read in like um whatever you whatever the general hodgson for example or Watts or whatever right i mean there, there, there's a general on the reading list of of, of mm. islam 101 in, in most colleges and, and, and universities right and they're, they're talking about islam as something which they assumed for the audience is something and an, an something outside and it's always a, it's a very strange feeling to read that that that, that in english you're reading the, the literature in English was always assumed that Islam is something foreign outside and unfamiliar mm. and the starting point whether for what's is maybe something like um like Christianity or secular liberal society or secular liberal sort of Marxist leanings the, 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 those are kind of sort of assumptions most of all anglophone authors historically have on on um on Islam, and then we're reading it. Born in Muslim families, English is our first language, and you read that, and you think, "Well, that's not unfamiliar. That's 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 mm. that's instinctual to me." Mm. So, what is is Islamic? Is a question that is is very much we can argue an Anglophone question, or maybe other European languages as well. Let me read this yeah, out though. Yeah. Let me just read this out and then I'll let you end about Anglophone Islam and, and whatever you have to say because I think it gives you a taste of why I found this book very difficult, right? This is like on page 445, right? Um, I, would like, I would like here to present an example from rural India. Historically in the village of the Punjab, when Sikh, when Sikh wrestlers go down in the pit to fight, the battle cry, battle cry before committing themselves to combat is the shout, Ya Ali, the, 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 the fourth caliph in Islam, mm. the, the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad. Then he goes on to, you know, further in the book. Um, at the moment, when the wrestler goes down to the pit of combat, when he screws his courage to the sticking place for the grappling of sinew and spirit that it is to come, his being our identity, who he is, in italics, are first and foremost the wrestler, the warrior, the heroic young man. When in that condition he calls upon Ali, he does so because to be a wrestler, the warrior, the young man, is to be B, B is in italics, Ali. The Sikh wrestler gives meaning to himself by this engagement with the context of the revelation of Islam. All of that's in italics. In this moment, the Sikh wrestler is not a Muslim, but he has, in italics, committed himself to meaning making in terms of Islam. Mm. Stop. His act is, italics, precisely an Islamic act. 
it is italics meaningful in terms of Islam full stop back to normal just as a Muslim makes for him himself the self is in italics in terms of Islam by engagement with a context of revelation the meaning which ultimately derives from hermeneutical engagement with pretext and or text so does a Muslim that's just bloody hell man so I know what you're saying but at the same time I find it a refreshing attitude that makes use it's useful for me in some of my work so one thing I find it useful and and or let me say how Shahab Ahmed is trying to use it in my understanding is there's this question about Islamic philosophy and people say well it should be called Arabic philosophy because it's in the Arabic language and you have Christian and Jewish philosophers who are part of what you would call uh, are sometimes okay. categorized as Islamic so how can Arab and Jewish philosoph- uh, Christian and Jewish philosophers be Islamic philosophers and he kind of says well actually they're engaging with the you know ideas emerging from Islamic pretext and text and therefore even if they're Jewish even if they're Christian they are Islamic philosophers because they're operating within that paradigm they're making things meaningful in terms of Islam even if it's in relation to Judaism or Christianity so um, maybe from very biased reasons of you know wanting Islam to you know capture the work of (laughs) Christian and Jewish philosophers I find that a, a valuable framework but then it also comes back to some of the stuff I'm seeing in, in the kind of research I'm doing. Um, and for me, the question comes in with what you have is uh, in the US and in the UK, lots of hip hop, uh, grime, drill artists whose uh, religion is in Islam, but whose lyrics are peppered with Islamic terminology and phrases and quite often make sense of things in relation to Islam uh, through the fact that they're using Islamic terminology and expressions and phraseology. Um, and so they make sense of their lives in relation to Islam. And I look at that, um, and from a strict perspective of what is Islam, which is based in the legal text, I can't, there's nothing Islamic or meaningfully Islam, uh, meaningfully part of Islam in what they're doing. Uh, but at the same time, I know there is, I can sense there is. They're using these terms for a reason, they've used the term dunya. For a reason, they're using the phrase Alhamdulillah for a reason. There's something there which is powerful and important and meaningful to them. And that is in some way part of that broader tradition of Islam. It is in some way related to the, you know, um, the revelation of Islam. So again, kind of coming at it as a social scientist, as someone who's looking at contemporary Islam, I want, I, I need a framework to make sense of what they're doing. What are these non-Muslim Hip hop drill and uh, grime artists doing when they use Islamic terminology in their um, artistic expression. Um, and Shahab Ahmed's framework gives me something to do. It gives me a way of cracking into that particular question. So, um, you know, I, I can see how this is kind of um, sort of what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, you know, Shahab Ahmed writes like a French philosopher as if he doesn't care about being understood um, and he doesn't seem to want to break it down but at the same time I think that framework does give us something to work with and I I do feel like you know there's there's this second part and I keep saying this to people is there's this someone needs to come in and kind of write the second part of that work which is um you know giving us a way to take a broad conceptualization like that of Shab Ahmed's but also bring it in line with an Islamic um doctrinal framework because there are things there which need to be made sense of in the sense that, um, you know, the idea of something like Islamic heresy. There are some forms of heresy which are distinctly Islamic. So, um, you know, they're not, you know, certain heresies in the Islamic historic tradition, you can't just say they're Christian, you can't say they're Jewish. They're part of the Islamic history. They're part of the Islamic tradition. You know, the fact that people are writing against them means they're also part of that milieu of uh, Islamic scholarly expression. So there is a re- there is a need to be able to see what's Islamic about this heresy, even if it's quite broadly accepted by Muslims that this is something outside the bounds of Islam. What is meaningfully Islamic in that heresy? In the same way that sort of you know some people today say secularism is a Christian heresy. Um, you know, there's something meaningful in secularism today, which is related to the history of the church and the Christian church mm. that isn't true in Islam. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's this, uh, I, I, I find it useful, even if we're talking about things which are 
normally well outside the boundaries of what we think of as being Islam. Okay, I think this hour is going to come to hour and a half because you you brought up so many other things, and I know I know I know you want. If you're okay with that, otherwise we can we can. I'll keep going as long as you need me. Um, I'm happy as like I said, I'm I'm what did you very pleased to have the coffee? opportunity to talk to you. You said you wanted some coffee. Like, we'll try. Well, uh, I'm okay actually because what I did was when we were having our uh, technical problems earlier, I just went and made one. So that's given me that's given me the energy to keep going. Okay, so you see these questions just throw up. I hope I hope there's other people who will be happy to contribute um, instead of me stigmatized for for having bringing up these questions, which which is a very immature response. I hope there's there's, there's people um, who, who feel they've got something meaningful to to um, uh, co contribute. Um, because I just I, I just feel like, like, I just feel like we're at this juncture. Okay. And here I'm talking about me and you as like, we're both Bengali, we've got Bengali parents, right? Mm. Uh, speaking English as our first language we've been Muslim since we were kids, right? We, we, we actually believe in the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad, right? Which is always taboo to sort of explicitly say in, um, kind of traditional in academic, academic context, in, in, yeah. in academic sort of field of study of Islam, right? Mm. And I'm sort of like fed up of that. And I'm like, just like, so do you, like, you know, we can, we can have conversations, right? But, you know, we can, we can, we can, there's nothing strange about that. Um, but anyway, um, Where do we go with this? Let's. Well, I want to talk about your Anglophone Islam. Mm. So, because this is what you write about in here, um, and you describe it as the new Persianate. Because what what one thing that I, that 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 I think is beautifully described in in Shahab Ahmed's book is this idea of the the Balkan, so the Bengal to Balkans complex, which is mm. that in the Muslim world historically, uh, you had this common idiom, okay, cultural idiom. Which is manifested in this kind of Persianate uh, culture, the works of Saati and Hafiz would have been understood by someone in in Dhaka as it would have been someone in I don't know in Istanbul, all right? So that 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 is very that 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 and then I I I feel what's happened is and then there's, there was a rupture with obviously this rise of the fall of the, the Caliphate, rise of nationalism, and also. Um, I've spoken about this personally and I sort of curtail it now. There's an, so I'm going to keep it oblique because I don't want to um, unnecessarily upset people. Uh, a certain 18th century movement through uh, later um, newfound wealth was able to sort of become, promote itself to, 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 to around the world and, and to, our, to the diaspora here in the Anglosphere. I believe that was very cause sort of great cultural rupture as well right mm. along with obviously stuff like colonialism all that kind of stuff right um and so and so although it's important to i think to to, to be aware of that and reconnect with that we don't have to parrot it mm -hmm. okay mm. It's, it's about these kind of meta objectives ultimately okay and so you, you're arguing that that anglophone islam Okay, or is now the new Persianate uh, in terms of how it how sort of Muslims are united. And, and, and on, on, on a on an anecdotal level, there, there, there seems a truth in, in that. In terms of like, I see, for example, my cousins in Bangladesh would be listening to English language preachers first and foremost, and, mm. Khan and Bilal Phillips and whatever. And I find, I find very interesting how they're the, they're the go to preachers for them. And I think that tells us about the nature of the world and globalization and all that kind of stuff. Tell us about your manifesto for, for Anglophone Islam, which you describe here. Sure. Thank you for giving me the segue to talk about my own work. Um, it's a very generous thing to do, um, but also uh, exciting for me. So Anglophone Islam is me trying to describe something I think I'm seeing. Um, and I think the jury is still out whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think we'll only really be able to answer the that question maybe in 100, 150, 200 years time. Uh, but what we are seeing is uh, English emerge as a language of Islamic scholarship, expression, artistic expression, meaning making. 
um, and become a dominant means of accessing Islam, um, predominantly because of the internet. I think I think the digital age has made that you know um, uh, one very important factor. You know, our um, cousins back in Bangladesh, you know, at one point accessing Bilal Phillips or Hamza Yusuf would not have been an option. Um, now it's easier than going to the you know someone who's locally based geographically in the in the local masjid, for example. So there's factors making English dominant, but alongside that, I think it's not just the use of English as a language. There are certain things within the language, which uh, and within the kind of uh, paradigm, I guess, of uh, Anglophone Islam, which are becoming dominant. So things like a more rationalist um, textual orientation for Islam. I think that's one one aspect of it. Um, things like that experience of colonialism and migration being quite important, um, you know, uh, aspects of religion and culture as well, um, if I can phrase it like that, sort of religion and culture just being two really important terms for expressing people's relationship to Islam. And I think our discussion has, been, has kind of shown that. Um, I, I don't have the linguistic capacity in Arabic or Persian, um, nor the historical understanding, but I always I find it curious how would you know, a 12th, 11th, 10th century Muslim polymath have made sense of this discussion we're having about Islamic and Islamic cuts. Yeah. You know, what would they make, make of that? How would they view it? You know, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's these kind of things which I think are part of the Muslim experience today as expressed and engaged in through in English. Um, and the way it kind of relates to some of my own work is, um, at least in the British context, uh, I can kind of confidently say that one of the most important means of religious communal organizing in Britain for Muslims is the congregation and the mosque. And historically, it's not always been the case. Sometimes the mosque was quite a secondary institution for communal religion, but definitely in the UK, it's emerging as a dominant one. And I think um, it, it's possible to make or maybe extend that argument to other parts of the diasporic Muslim world, although someone else would have to make the evidence case for that. So I think all of that is quite interesting, exciting. There are things changing, things shifting. And increasingly as well, we're seeing the production of primary important parts of Islamic scholarship emerging in English first and translated secondary. So all of that, I think, points to a really interesting new development in Islam. Um, uh, whether it's good or bad, I think remains to be seen. Coming back to this thing of... Um of language mm -hmm. and how um, we're talking about Islam or the divine or the, the, the teachings of, of, of the Prophet Muhammad in a language which historically has not been the language of the, of the Muslim people as such, like Farsi became or, mm -hmm. or Yoruba or Hausa or whatever, right? Um, and change is possible because obviously there was a time when the Turkic peoples were identified as a non-people, non-Muslim people, and obviously now when you think of Turkic people, you think of them as predominantly Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you think of Turkish as a Muslim language, right? And and you would expect to find works talking about Islam, obviously in Arabic, but also in Farsi and Turkish now. When it comes to um, English, um, there is a there is a phenomenon. It might it may be a small one, but I think there's something significant in it, which is how Muslims have kept alive certain words which have died out, um, like ablution. Mm. Let's try and come up with some circumambulation. Definitely a big one. Um, superrogatory. Yeah, there's one Hamza Yusuf uses as well, was it? Verily, uh, sorry, verily, that's the best one. Verily. verily is good, yeah. Yeah, who uses verily otherwise? Um, uh, Hamza Yusuf uses something for do instead of ablution. Uh, lustration, lustration. Like that was when I had to Google out when he used it. I was like, what the hell is lustration? <laughs> but, um, you know archaic word but preserving the in the language yeah but that has that that's that, 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 that small that small seemingly small sort of uh 
flippant kind of observation mm. you see as as a sort of as, as part of like a a bigger phenomena explain that mm. Yeah, so I, I think there is this emerging vocabulary used by Muslims to express things in Islam, about Islam, which have uh, obviously English etymological root. Um, and like one of the ones I find interesting is the term theology. Um, you know, theology, you could say it's kalam, you could say it's fiqh, but really it's not either. Um, it's its own thing that now when Muslims engage in some kind of um, scholarly endeavor in relation to whether it's the Quran or the Hadith or you know um, any any kind of um, scholarly output, we kind of broad it or bracket it sometimes under the um, term theology, and you know it, it's a distinctively anglophone term with a distinctively anglophone meaning, but which is also uniquely Muslim when it's used by Muslims. When we talk about Islamic theology or Muslim theology. And yet those kind of terms like supererogatory, like ablution, which are beginning to develop a particular um, category of meaning in English that is uniquely um, part of a constellation of terms used by Muslims. Uh, other, you know, phrases as well, you can pull up like um, uh, house mosque, you know, uh, nice term. I like that, you know, house mosque. It, house mosque. Yeah. Like if I said to you, it's a house mosque. Uh, converted domestic property oh, for a mosque. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe that's a, a Welsh one. Maybe I have a sort of kept that too uh, localized. Um, you know, you hear phrases like to the highest heavens. Um, again, kind of, um, you know, sort of used by Muslims, perhaps much less than universal at the moment, but beginning to develop a lexicon of vocabulary. Um, and I think this is only going to continue. Um, to the point that um, you know, Muslims will have uh, a broad toolbox and toolkit of distinctly Islamic phrases to express distinct Islamic concepts, um, which didn't exist in English. And so, I think that's interesting to see where that goes. Um, and I think it'll accompany sort of what we've seen in Persian um, uh, in the contemporary period. So, you know, just as me and you probably grew up talking about namaz, not salah, um, I think there's going to be a similar sort of uh, evolution in which um, Islamic uh, phrases in English become uh, categories which are important to Muslims globally. I mean, so, so this podcast was primarily ab about the study of pre-modern history. Um, so re re starting... In within the what I call the Islamic Islamic hate with, with the eight in, in brackets, um, ecunim, right? Um, because then because then it's not just about geography; it's about sort of imaginations of mm. beyond, beyond the, the borders, and that that's as much as part of like a territory in its in its very conceptual sense. If it isn't physical, although the podcast is about that. This thing of language is important, okay, because obviously we, we, we're studying these things in the English language, right? Um, and so c c coming back to this thing about um, the Anglophone, and because we feel the question, what is Islamic, is very much something um, idi idiosyncratic to a discourse about Islam in specifically in English or in European language, right? Mm. Question, as we, as, as we feel something idiosyncratic to our mode of, of conversation right now, right? The other thing I want to explore about the, the issue of language and Anglophone Islam is um, this thing about outside and insider, right? And, and, and we said earlier how reading... Um, English, um, at least text, at least things you, you, you're told to read in, in university, how, how it, primarily in English, Islam, Islam is always seen as an outside phenomena, and it's assumed the reader, for the reader as well, it's an outside phenomena. And then when we encounter it, we feel this kind of dissonance. Right? Mm. Mm. Um, and you know, like how, um, like the King James Bible, is considered 
not just as a religious text, but because it's much as part of like the sort of a phenomenon of English language, right? Mm-hmm. And then also sort of then you have Shakespeare, right? That's part of what it means to be English, right? And then I think like like if we come back, if we come now, and then we simply think of like translations of the Quran. Are, shouldn't those be also seen as part of English language and culture, mm-hmm. development in English language and culture? And then if we look at um, authors, like some like Le- Leila Abul Atla, um, the S- Sc- Sudanese Scottish writer, right? Who's a practicing Muslim, right? Her contributions in literature is an impact upon the English mm-hmm. language, right? And you know, like how they say, like, a rose after Shakespeare is not, it's not the same as it was before, right? Do these, such, surely these engagements, the Quran translations and literature by practicing Muslims, surely that's that is that is part of by by its nature part of the english language and culture right? mm. so part of that we have to comment on and then related to that is this idea of um what we call islamization mm. so some 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 english speakers or some people call them english they call themselves English, could feel threatened by that. And they feel like this is a um, a diluting of our language, a distortion of our language, distortion of our heritage, distortion of our culture, right? And you know what? I can understand that totally. And, and I, I don't think that should be dismissed lightly, those, those kind of feelings and sentiments, right? Um, but it's disconcer- ch- change, is, change is always disconcerting. That's just, just human nature, right? Mm. And then, so it's about our attitude towards change, right? Uh, and therefore, you need some kind of empathy with people who 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 feel upset at change. Right? That's that's a very natural thing, right? But then, I I think I think coming back to the idea of of the of the presenting Islam as a primordial rather than as a as a as a, as a phenomena, right? What you're demonst- what you can demonstrate is that it's not about changing, it's about uncovering. It's about you realizing a truth within yourself, right? It's like you know, like it's said that one of the ways that these sort of Turkic tribes became Muslim was that you had these sort of uh, Sufi figures on the frontiers right going to them and saying you know what you guys you guys are muslims but you just don't realize it yet mm. which is a very different approach because it's, 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 it's a different approach than an approach of sort of of of, of, of telling people that no, you got to become like us and so i'm wondering whether this engagement with language both quran translations and and and, and literature is not islamization but an uncovering of of a of a primordial common human uh, reality, which is obviously that's we would articulate it as of s- s- surrender to this mm. unfathomable divine. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, I can see that kind of marriage uh, between. Oh. Um, English language expressions and scholarship and even non-fiction literary expressions uh, by Muslims um, and a kind of relationship with a uh, underlying framework within the English language, which you could argue has um, that sort of inbuilt fitra, if you want to say, that natural inclination towards Islam or that kind of universalization, universal uh, Islam present and so I'm kind of thinking of um, I know Abdul Hakim Murad has talked a lot about this but I've also seen it in other contexts of that relationship between you know sort of Islam and non-conformism in Britain uh, for example and the way in which you know congregationalism and independent churches and 
uh, a willingness to question orthodoxy about Christianity creates a very strong symmetry with the idea of Islam as a tradition that is a continuation of what uh, came with Jesus. Um, and a lot of people have tried to bring those two together. And I, I completely agree with you in the sense that there is going to be an impact in the English language you know, uh, globally through the endeavors and work of Muslim scholarship and expression in Islam. And my only disappointment, I guess, is there hasn't been anything so influential that it becomes an anchor point in the canon of English literature. So, you know, um, in the same way that the poetry of Hafiz and Rumi, if you're, uh, you know, Persian, even if you're not Muslim, you can't really avoid it. It's so important. It's so significant. It's so influential. It's so well done. Um, there hasn't been yet, you know, a kind of work written by a Muslim Tolkien or a Muslim C.S. Lewis or a Muslim sort of Shakespeare or a, or a you know, um, poetic expression that just becomes, you know, unavoidably part of canon. I think maybe some of Martin Ling's work has been kind of talked about in that vein, but it's not as influential as, um, you know, I think um, uh, something could be. So eventually I think that will happen. And I think at that point, the entirety of English afterwards will 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 be thought of as differently in the same way. I like that phrase. I've not actually come across it, but a rose isn't the same thing after Shakespeare as it was before. I think there is a work coming um, by someone who may be not even born yet, or maybe is a toddler running around, running around now, who will write a work in English that becomes so influential that it kind of changes English thereafter. Um, and I think you're right as well. I think that has a beautifully creative um, uh Import, uh, import, importance to it because I think once and this is a process in the way already but I think once contemporary you know um, uh, people in society in Britain or elsewhere start seeing Islam as a culture a, a, a something which is part of themselves part of their own history part of their own country um, uh, you know, part of their own um, history in, in as a people, I think the entire framework changes. And even non-Muslims will find themselves able to engage with it in a much more healthy and creative way than has become prior. So um, in a way, sort of coming to your kind of question, I think there is a work yet to be written that is so influential that will do that, um, although we're seeing examples of it already. I mean, there might not need, there might not, but there might not be a need for like this one big mm. splash. Just, just by mere engagement with um, creative language, right? Or literature, for example. Yeah. Um, ha ha has an effect. Has has those ripple effects, right? Because yeah. because if, yeah. if if like if 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 like if you're gonna if someone's gonna do a study on uh, poetry written in 2022, right? And there's some Muslim people writing poetry in 2022, right? And um, uh, the, the 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 language engages with those um, sacred ideas, right? Mm. Then a fair study of poetry in 2022 will have to bring that in. Yeah, right? yeah. The... How, how you how you do something, right? Um, and and so. Uh, and so, because because uh, you talked about this kind of conversation between texts and whatever, right? So so we all we all read each other. That's just that's how you, that's how you, if you want to write poetry, you got to read other poetry, right? Mm. And so um, and you do your best to read as, as much as you can, as widely as you can, right? And so every, so an influence will come upon you, whether directly or through a couple of degrees removed, right? So that's that's that one thing about sort of sh sh shifts in in um, uh, language and idea. It doesn't always have to require sort of one big uh, mm. splash. It's just many tributaries in an ocean can mm. influence the the the, the 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 nature of that of that ocean, um, and um, and also is is the the, the 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 fact is is that coming back to this idea of those. Um, of those of those kind of the, the, that the anecdotal I, uh, understanding of, of of the conversion of of of, of, of those t Turkic tribes, is not about change, 
it's about it's about uncovering it's not about trying to be convinced about something it's about coming to a realization so it's not about mm. an external force changing you it's about you self-editing with like um an intrinsic motivation okay um and then if if if, if your usage of language has an aesthetic merit then there's a there's a there's, there's a greater kind of welcoming of that impact upon your life mm. um okay i think we should round up because otherwise this can go on for two hours and it's not fair on you um why don't you before we end uh because there's so much more i want to engage talk to you about and then the problem with this this medium is i'm very conscious that there's not just there's like other people i'm i'm, I'm other people watching this and it's very difficult to, to talk when you when you have a sense of other people looking at you and listening to you mm. um but it's good because this is the first time i think we've, we've ever spoken like this we've had sort of correspondence but um um i did want to talk to you about this and i know I, I would welcome um other people join us and i know this is sort of distracted this kind of has sort of detracted from sort of the central um purpose of of um of what this um of, of the purpose of the podcast which is pre, pre-modern Islamic history but i felt that it's related because it's about a method and methodology and things like that mm. And as more conversations like this to it, 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 it take place, um, I hope in the future. Because as I said to you before we came on, I don't think um, religion and social media go together. Um, I think I think social media, by its, its, its inherent nature, is profane. It's created to be addictive. It's created to be um, intrusive, mm. and uh, at best, um, it should only be used as a bulletin board for for things in real life. Um, I don't think what I'm doing is religion per se. It's it's um, it's history. It's culture. Uh, I, I see myself as having a sort of kind of, kind of teaching position. I treat this as a classroom, and I wouldn't say anything that I wouldn't in a classroom. And I try to sort of curtail like things like that. Um, before we end, tell us what you're currently doing and things you can look forward to so um thank you again and i I want to echo your uh, kind of sentiments it's been a really enjoyable conversation and for me um having someone who's uh in the kind of sphere of scholarship that you're based in is useful because i know you're applying a lens of criticism and critique that i might not get if i sat down in a room with sort of scientists um i think that's only really kind of beneficial one to the scholarly endeavor but also to the kind of desire to grow in our understanding of islam which i think um is what fuels us as individuals as muslims you know we don't want to just have knowledge for knowledge sake it's it's something else deeper than that that we want to um discover so thank you for having me on and, and engaging in this conversation um and what am i working on at the moment so i'm quite excited because it's a project i've uh, wanted to do for some time and I'm now being able to devote a bit more energy to, and that is the history of Islam in Wales. Mm. Um, so I'm a local to Cardiff. I've been here my entire life. Uh, odd bits of travel here and there. Um, and, you know, Wales is its own unique place. I think it has a landscape that is, uh, for me, deeply meaningful. But also, um, I quite enjoy that idea of studying, um, you know, uh one kind of the deeper history i've discovered you know some older things about muslims in in wales that i was surprised by but really it's the post-war generation um you know those pioneers who kind of came and settled in wales made it their home and are now sort of um coming to the age where they're passing away so i'm uh seeking to capture those experiences as quickly as possible um, and documenting it, making it something meaningful and hopefully an exhibition that can be hosted in mosques and in museums and uh, so on. So that's what I'm working on. It's a bit of a change again from what I've done previously, um, but I think it is something which is important both to the people locally, but also to the um, broader project of, um, you know, an Islam and Yanglophone in a way, um, because um, uh, I think if we don't have our histories, we're, we're very 
anchorless um, in in society. So uh, that's what I'm working on, and um, I'm you know looking forward to getting stuck in actually in September. Great, um, thank you for joining us and for giving your morning like this. Um, uh, thank you for getting up to this podcast. This was our first recorded episode, so it's um, you've honoured us greatly. Um, and I hope we can have more of these conversations. Thank you for the people who patiently uh, watched all of this. Um, and we would I appreciate you, really would appreciate your thoughts and comments if you share those um, uh, with us. And uh, inshallah, we hope to be making uh, more of these and we welcome your suggestions. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.